Our world values grasping power, but it does not value the giving of power. It values being strong, but it does not value the, the giving, the rendering of strength. It values the exaltation and the self-expression, the expression of the self. It, it doesn't value the taking of that self and, and bringing it and giving it to another. You know, it turns out that God's values are incredibly different to our modern ways. It turns out that heaven's rewards are given on a completely different basis compared to this world's rewards. Truth in 10-ish in three, two, one. What is a woman? We considered last time that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, uh, it is revealed to us that God made human beings male and female according to a gender binary. Of course, something that's apparent from creation ever since. So we answered the question then, what is a man? Today we answer the question, what is a woman? A woman is an adult human female. That's the easy part of the answer. But the question arises immediately, is there not something more to womanness? Is there something about a woman's nature that is womanly? Is there a thing called femininity? Now, we know that there is. Uh, I think we know that a woman is not simply the sum of her biological pieces, as we know that about a man as well. And that's the kind of extra detail that is given to us in Genesis 2 and 3, when the woman is commissioned with certain tasks, as the man was, and these tasks are her creation mandate. And her creation mandate is what she's asked to do, but it's important to note, and it's clear from the reading in Genesis 2, that God made her expressly to do those things. So, they are in harmony with who she is, her biology, her psychology, and so forth. So, the obvious result is that as we find out what she is made to do, we find out also what she is like. There is one word which God uses in Genesis 2, which captures all of this, and it is helper. That is spoken directly from God. And in Genesis 3, another important word is added, and that is mother, and it comes from the name Eve. Let's look at those, because they teach us a great deal. Um, that Hebrew translated helper is, is the word azer. Uh, and one of the closest English words to its meaning is one that we just don't use, because it's antiquated and it sounds strange. Uh, but really a close match is the word sucker, S-U-C-C-O-U-R, or in American spelling it may just be an O-R. And it sounds weird, but it, its meaning is very beautiful. It means to render strength, enablement, support and aid, to, to bring, to provide, to, to render strength, enablement, support and aid. And it also may contain suggestions of forming an alliance. So a woman is a human being with a really unique quality. She's gifted with what it takes to give herself to the strengthening of others. Actually, we see this uh, in a subtle point made here too. Uh, there's a subtle there, subtlety in Genesis 2 where she is made with a mandate that is firstly actually towards another person. Uh, in that case, it's Eve towards Adam. And notice that interpersonal orientation. Um, this is a, if you think about this for a minute, it's, it's quite a hated thought today uh, because we live in a world where self-advancement and individual power and independence are sort of the things that are highly coveted. And uh, if you watch the culture, you'll see that those sorts of things are actually preached especially to young women. Our world values grasping power, being powerful, but it does not value the giving of power. It values being strong, but it does not value the, the giving, the rendering of strength. Um, it values the exaltation and the, the self-expression, the expression of the self. In fact, that's a big part of sort of how we like to live these days. But it doesn't value the taking of that self and, and bringing it and giving it to another. It values being first, but it doesn't value being second. You know, it turns out that God's values are incredibly different to our modern ways. And that demands our attention in itself. It turns out that heaven's rewards are given on a completely different basis compared to this world's rewards. Uh, and scripture uses this word that's behind all this help or sucker to describe femininity. So 
it's no wonder that it matches generally, not just with what scripture teaches, but with the findings even of modern psychology. We know, for example, that women have special abilities and special interests in the interpersonal realm. Uh, think of the phrase, a woman's intuition. Uh, why does that exist? Well, it has a basis in reality. We have experience of it. Uh, there's an interpersonal antenna that, that's finely tuned and women tend to be very um, good at having faculties that understand people in a way that actually sees past the words that they may speak, um, that can anticipate needs and, and, and meet them, can discern deficiencies and weaknesses and intercede for them, can see anxieties uh, below the surface and comfort them. They can be interpersonal strength-giving, nurture-giving pillars of help. One thing I've noticed in all my travels, in all my interactions and speaking, when I uh, meet with so many people, is that there is actually a clear difference of interest between the sexes. It's the same and yet it's different. You, you see women expressing questions and, 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 and queries and conversation in a way that is really expressed, betraying an interest in the person in a way that doesn't come through in men. And maybe that's why women's novels uh, have sort of relationships and the interpersonal dynamics at the center of the story. You think of something like a Jane Austen um, or a Pride and Prejudice, you know, uh, he, he likes her, he doesn't like her, she doesn't like him, now they like each other again, phew, they all live happily ever after. It's a, it's a relationship story. Um, men's books tend to be about missions and conquests and things. And that's just no surprise because God made us male and female. He made us in a certain way in order to suit us to do certain things. That's the first word, helper. Here's the second word, mother. And I think I can say this. I think that there's nothing about women that God has endorsed more than motherhood. I, I wish more women's conferences and Bible studies made that point more openly and freely and clearly. Uh, the first endorsement of motherhood is very early in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God announced that Satan's head would be crushed through a mother's child. Sin and death, God said, will end. That's the grand plan for the cosmos. And in his first announcement of that plan, the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, he places humble, forgotten, selfless, and often despised motherhood right there. It's the first thing he said about his plan. Uh, this verse establishes a broader rhythm in history as well, though. I mean, uh, you can look at uh, the account of the scriptures and you see that the seed of the woman, to use the phrase in Genesis 3.15, becomes the hope of the earth. Um, the worst moments in biblical history, from the long anarchy of the days of the judges to the enslavement of the people of God in Egypt to the 400 silent years at the end of the Old Testament when the people are longing for a Messiah, each of them ends with what? A motherhood story. Hannah prayed for Samuel, who ended the days of the judges. Jochebed hid her child in the bulrushes, and that's why he grew up with Pharaoh and ended the days of slavery. John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb. Mary's visited by an angel. These divine interventions to make mothers. And we see through history that the prospect that every child born could be his mortal foe that would fulfill that promise to crush his head, plagued Satan. And that is why he provoked demented evil against children. You think of Herod and Pharaoh, for example, both initiated massacres at those moments I just described, massacres of children. And it continues today, because whilst the next child born might not be Jesus, he's already come, it could still be Satan's next powerful enemy, standing against wickedness and promoting salvation in the new generation. I've often wondered whether that fear that he's always had is now amplified by a desire for revenge. Because, you know, it did happen. Jesus did crush his head. And what an insult that must have been to the prince of angels, mighty in power, swollen with pride, to be undone by a plan which involved a young, diminutive, poor, powerless Jewish woman, a mother. And there is a great revenge being exacted against mothers and children. Perhaps that is why there is an all-out deranged assault on this kind of femininity and feminine calling from every single angle today. I mean, I could do a whole talk just on 
I mean, how many ideas are alive and well today uh, in the West, even in the church, which undermine all of this, which relegate it to the sidelines? I could speak for hours on it. For more, for more and more women, this just isn't a top priority in our culture. Uh, the belief is that this deprives her of her self-fulfillment and her true empowerment. She'll give herself to animals and fur babies before children. She'll give herself to a boss and a corporation before she gives herself in other contexts like a family or a marriage. She will pursue sexual liberation and live young and free until she hits her mid-30s and realizes that she had forgotten what is most important. And you can barely even find a women's Bible study to address it. And I haven't even touched on the worst stuff, like abortion, for example, and the fact that most transgenderism, statistically speaking, is among young women. Satan is alive and well, and he still hates femininity because it killed him, and it continues to oppose him in a way that strikes fear and revenge into his heart. A final thought before I finish. For both this topic and the what is a man topic last time, it seems apparent um, that the most direct context for these qualities which are spoken of in Genesis is marriage. And I think women feel this most acutely because the question often comes back to me, what about me, a, a single woman, a, a, a woman unable to have children, what, what can I do? And it's important to note a couple of things. The short answer is, well, you can do pretty much anything, obviously all subject to God's will and providence and wisdom and prudence. Uh, and maybe there are some things which really are opposed to femininity altogether, but not, not many. Um, but note that these words are commissioning words. They're good words. Um, they're words to be valued and taken incredibly seriously, but they're not the final words. They're not hard limits. But I want us to consider the quality also called femininity, which we call femininity, which really lies behind these words, the nature of a woman which is articulated in a word like helper. She's not necessarily married, but she has a gifting which aligns with those qualities we've already mentioned uh, in this segment. And she may do many things in life, but it would be a mistake to entirely forget the unique thing that her femininity brings into this world which no amount of masculinity will ever compensate for. This world is a whole world of people and a whole world of children and there are so many things that you can identify today which are your help to the ones that God has brought to your attention. Our world values so, grasping power but it does not you, value the giving of power. Stop it values being strong but it does not value the... the yeah, you. So um, one of the things I'll share with you is, is that um, when you talk about feminine, femininity, my mom, when, when I was, I guess, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, again, I was riding a bike and riding a friend's bike and the brakes didn't work. And so I'm flying down the road and getting ready to turn into this friend's driveway or area and, and caught the curb and went flying over the curb and dislocated my shoulder. And um, so my friends brought me home and they, I walk in the door and my dad says, stop kidding around, stop joking around. You know, cut it out, boy, stop joking around. You know, and I'm laying on the couch and I'm going, oh, oh, and then it pops back into place. And, um, and he goes, you're not funny, you're not funny. My mom comes in and goes, are you all right? And I'm like, no, but dad thinks I'm kidding, okay? <laughs> and so you can definitely see there's a difference, right? So, and um, that's one of the things is that, you know, last night we celebrated Krista's birthday, which is a couple days away, and, and, and my dad had came, and my dad's gotten a lot softer and gentler, but when we were younger, man, he was a bruiser. So, um, and my mom was always the gentle one, the easygoing one. So that said, so this morning, um, I'm going to go through some of the announcements on the third page of your bulletin or announcements. Inside your bulletin, you'll see there's um, basically a sheet. If you want the Easter lilies, please fill this out, drop it in the plate. The price is $20 for those. We need to have that count by March 3rd. So um, that's just next week. So please, um, if you're interested in those, make sure we get that back. I was just checking, sunrise for Easter morning is 641. So our sunrise service will be 640. So Easter, March 31st, our sunrise service will be 640. So, and it'll be up the top of the street here, so we'll watch the, the sunrise. 
So that said, then some of the other announcements we are um, starting, or in the book of Isaiah, so you're welcome to join us for that on Monday nights. And then Dave's group met this past Thursday, so two weeks from now they'll meet again on Thursday, and they're walk, working through the book of Mark. Um, and then, I guess, Dave, you want to talk about you too, that you got the date that you were looking for, right? And then the last slide we had up there was game night. Um, they're going to do game night again um, March 8th, so that's two weeks, from, two weeks from now, I guess. So um, on a Friday night, right? Yeah. Friday night. So, um, and some of the other announcements. Grief Share started up this past week, and and Laurie's been hosting that. I know she's um, headed towards Virginia right now, so just keep them in prayer as they travel. Um, Ushers, if you're interested in usher ushering, you can see Ann or you can see me. Um, calendars. I know we're now we're in the <laughs> almost done you know the first two months of the year but there's a couple left there um if you want it any of your giving statements um if you need one please contact me my my um cell phone number is the number on the bulletin please contact and let me know you need any of your giving statement i think we've caught up with everybody who needed one so far also on march 2nd laurie is hosting basically a, um an expression art class to kind of help people um deal with stress and various other things and then um let's see I think that pretty much covers the things I need to cover. If you're interested in flowers for the altar, there's a sign up on the wall in the back there. You can do that. And then um, and Women's Fellowship, their next one is going to be on March 12th, and that's usually Tuesday. So, And they meet at, at um, Crab Claw for lunch. So, um, yes? What? Yeah, blood. Uh, yeah, blood drive. Um, March 11th, I mean, May 11th, we're going to be doing a blood drive here um, in Fellowship Hall. So, um, and it'll be from 8 to 1 o'clock. And there will be flyers out next week. Uh, and we're just trying to go in. It's real easy to sign up. Uh, we're also going to have a couple of people in the back of the church on Sunday uh, for about 20 minutes. If people don't and not, don't know how to do it, and how they sign you up. So we're trying to work it all in to do that. And uh, uh, it should be a good thing. Uh, I already heard from the town council. We're all up for it. We've been announced. Okay, let's get up and pass the peace of God to one another this morning. I'm going to do the call of worship this morning if you get back to your seats. This one's interactive, okay? So this morning, this is going to involve you being um, moving around and active. You're going to take a couple dance steps. You're going to do clapping. You're going to do a shout loudly. So um, if you're, you'll stand with me this morning as we do this. We come today to worship our Savior who created us to worship in many ways. Now, praise the Lord, okay? There we go. So, you made us, Lord, so we would worship with our hands. See, wasn't that easy? Now we're not even done yet. So, you've given us eyes to see and admire your handiwork, oh God. See? See how hard that is? You guys had a hard time even doing that. Like, here's like, yeah. Okay. You have given us bodies that dance in worship of you. Uh, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> I, wait, 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 wait. You got to read it. Your part. I read my part. Read your part. <laughs> now, all you have to do is just a couple little steps. That's it, right? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> if you don't leave today different than you came in, I don't know what's wrong with you, okay? You, my Lord, have also made us to also worship you in stillness. Lord, we will be still and know you are the Lord. See, and somebody even had to laugh during that. Okay, this is the day the Lord has made. Now, you notice you have to smile the rest of the service, okay? So there we go. 
So we are going to sing this morning our first hymn, and we're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Does anyone have a praise you'd like to share this morning that God's done in your life this week? Kids, you did? So they're going to do you from top to bottom all over, over again. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. Okay, if you want to. <laughs> so I don't even know how to respond to that at this point. Okay, um... Anybody, anything else? Okay, Deb. Uh, my brother-in-law who had the heart. Uh, yes, the infection, right? Yes. With the pacemaker, right? All better at home. Everything is good. Thank God. They are telling him now you were really fortunate you were able to do that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. You got it. Anybody, anything else? Okay. Great job. You made it to 80 and here. Yes. Thank everybody for my church family. Amen. Amen. You didn't wear your shirts, though. We, we would have enjoyed the 80 for 80 shirts. That would have been good one more time. So um, anybody, anything else? Well, I'll share with you. I had um, basically, you can tell my stitches on the side of my face. Um, I, when Dave texted me the other day, he said, what, you have a bike accident? And, um, and no, they removed basically um, cancer that I had on my face. And so um, and I guess it's 25 stitches in counting it. But they got it, put it back together. And this guy guarantees that I won't have, that's what he said, right, Chris? He guarantees that I will not have a, a scar. And I said, I've got all these other ones. Why not have one more? So, um, um, and plus I said, when I give this body back to God, it's going to be a mess. So, um, and I'm getting closer, right? Seems like every year I got one more scar to add to it. So, but God is good. And um, it was hard for my dad when I told my dad and talked about it. We had prayed about this so many times and everything, and um, he, he, it was interesting when we talked the other day. He, he said, you know, sometimes I guess you have to trust that God isn't going to answer the way you're going to answer. I said, yeah, I know, but, but he, he struggled with that. He really struggled with the fact that, that it had to be cut out. So, um, so, so that said, I just want to thank God. It's a great day, and I want to thank you guys all for being here and praying for me. So um, that said, we're going to sing our second hymn this morning, and it's going to be Amazing Grace.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a great and awesome God you are. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the ability just to be able to come and worship and have this opportunity to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, may we just really rejoice in this day we've been given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to bring Rick up. He's going to read our scripture reading this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here. Uh, my name is Rick. My lovely wife, Rose, I sit over here every morning. She is lovely. She's yes. <laughs> um, we'll be reading from Isaiah 63. It's about uh, God's vengeance and redemption. Start in verse 1. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bozrah, with his garment stained crimson, who is robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red, like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments, and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk, and I poured their blood on the ground. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. <clears throat> Yes, the many good things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. <clears throat> Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Then his people recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them through the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them, who sent his glorious arm of power to be at Moses' right hand, who divided the waters before them to gain for himself everlasting renown, who led them through the depths like a horse in open country. They did not stumble. Like the cattle that go down to the plain, they were given rest by the Holy Spirit. This is how you guided your people to make your glorious name. Look down from heaven and see from your lofty throne and holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your might? Your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. For you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from old is your name. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. For a little while your people possessed your holy place, but now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. We are yours, we are yours from old but you have not ruled over them. They have not been called by your name. This is the word of the Lord. Revelation, we're going to be looking at the wine press of God. And um, as you can see, we're going through the book of Isaiah. We're just starting now. But um, at chapter 63, and he talks about the same thing um, that we're going to be talking about this morning. And just wanted to point that out, that um, in the Old Testament, that's, you know, when you look back and you think this is, is 600 years before God, 700 years before, I mean, before Jesus came and walked the earth, that he had already prophesied about those things. So I said this morning we're going to take our offering. So if you would, if I could have our ushers come forward, we're going to take the offering as we do that this morning. Would you please rise?
I'd ask you to be seated, but Dave's going to come forward and have you sing again. So. <laughs> I know. And just a reminder for anybody visiting today, we do have Sunday school right after this upstairs. Uh, so for middle school and high school age kids, we'll have uh, Sunday school today. So let's play. Uh, play. I'll play. You sing. <laughs> Lord, I need you. Well, we were, we're still clapping and That's smiling fine. from earlier, right? <laughs> Thank you for this morning, Lord. We ask as we go into your word that you would just speak to our hearts. Speak, Lord, loud and clear. Let us be able to hear and just discern, but also, Lord, to live it. We ask this all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so we're going to look at Revelation chapter 14, and we're moving into verse. We're going to pick up verse 8 where we left off last time. But um, I, I know that when Carl's here, it's always good to tell a Carl joke. And so... Um, and the interesting thing is that if I don't tell a Carl joke, people say, what about the Carl joke? So you don't listen to anything else but the Carl joke. Okay? <laughs> but last week, Carl was in the back, and he was, he was eating some cake and everything. And I think somebody asked him, he said, you know, um, Carl, what are the four stages of getting old? And Carl said, well, first you forget. He said, you know, he said, you forget names. And then he said, second, you forget faces. And he said, the third step is you forget to zip up. <laughs> he said, and the fourth phase is you forget to zip down. <laughs> He's getting that way. 
That's one of the better ones, oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we are going to look this morning, we are going to um, pick up at verse 8. Where we left off verse 8 was, it said, A second angel followed the first, declaring, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great city. She made all the nations drink of the wine of her immoral passion. And we're going to talk a lot about um, Babylon in the next couple of chapters, but especially chapter 18. Um, and, and so we get this picture of what's happening here. And, and Babylon can be a, a, a religious system. It can be an ideolo- uh, ideology. It can be a nation. And here it looks like it's the nation, the city. But a lot of people want to kind of say what they think Babylon is. And it, when you look at this, one of the things you have to realize about Babylon, Babylon was, um, is a power that allows people to, to lust in their passions, um, be involved in all the various things. They sponsor a lot of things that go on in the world. And the world is, is tied into the whole system economically and everything else of Babylon. And when you start to talk about Babylon, it's hard not to look at us, okay? I mean, if you look at us as a nation, right? Now, I'm not saying that's the case. We'll talk more about when we get to that. But we as a nation, what does our nation sponsor, right? I mean, in the last couple of years, we're involved in wars. We've got money going all over the place to all other countries except really helping our own people, right? And you start to look at things and go, well, wait a minute. You know what? We, we have this system that we do things with here. And um, what's happened more than anything else is that the world buys into it. The world is a part of it. And we will talk a lot more about this when we get in, like I said, in, in pre- the following chapters. We'll, we'll talk about it. So let's move to verse 9. Here's a third angel. Remember, the third angel here uh, followed the first two and declared in a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast and his image... And takes the mark on his forehead or his hand. So now we've got this declaration. Realize from the throne room of God, you're going to have a declaration of if anybody takes the mark of the beast, okay, whether on their hand or on, and, and not just that, but worships, right? We talked about the image last week with AI, the stuff that we have in AI, they could generate an image, right? And have that image be generated, and then we have AI producing a, a, its own Bible that you would worship from, and you realize that as you start to look at this, here you're going to have, you're, you're either going to have to worship God, or you're going to have to worship the beast. You don't have any choice. Either take the mark of the beast, and you worship the beast. And the interesting thing as we look at this and we move forward, realize that you have a choice, right? Everyone has a choice. But see, some people don't like to make choices, right? You know, do you ever decide to go out to dinner? Right? Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go, right? That's not going to happen here. You can't do that for three hours, right? What's happened here is you either worship the beast, and the beast will make sure if you don't worship him, you're put to death, okay? Or you worship God. There's only two alternatives here. That's it. So you get to verse 10, and verse 10 says, it says, that person will also drink of the wine of God's anger that has been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he will be tortured with fire and sulfur in front of the holy angels and in front of the Lamb. I, let's break this down a little bit. First off, undiluted. Why does it use the word undiluted? Because it's not tempered with God's mercy and God's grace. It's interesting because uh, Mike and I were talking about this a little bit before service. When you talk about judgment, there's various levels of judgment, right? You get an idea here that God is not going to temper this judgment of those who take the mark or worship the beast. There is no grace and mercy that's going to be applied. You got that? See, either you follow Jesus and realize what, who this is done in front of, right? Who's this done in front of? It's done in front of the holy angels and the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus, right? So this suffering is going to take place. And I want to make sure you get an idea of this. It's the punishment that's going to happen, and it's, it goes on forever. See, there's no break in this. It's going to happen forever. Either you choose to be with Christ and be with Christ forever, or guess what? You're going to be separated from him. So you've got this picture here, and it says, we'll be tortured with fire and sulfur in front of the holy angels and in front of the Lamb. Now you get to the next verse, and verse 11 says, and the smoke from their torture will go up forever and ever. You got the picture here, right? There's no break in this, right? It doesn't stop. See, when you reject Jesus and you decide to follow the beast, you, the mark of the beast, and you decide to worship him, there's no, there's no tolerance with God. 
You see, people want to say, I've heard people say before, I'd rather be first in hell than last in heaven. Let me tell you something. You do not want to be in hell. And you do not want to go through the torment that's going to be there. Because it's undescribable. You're going to have a physical body that's going to suffer this torment. And you realize here, those who worship the beast and, and the image of the beast, they're going to have this go on day in and day out. There's no rest during the day or night along with anyone who receives the mark of his name. So anyone who decides to follow the beast, right? You either worship him, okay? You take his image or you take the mark. They're going to receive this torment. And you well, man, this is pretty harsh, right? Well, let me ask you something. We've looked through Revelation so far. Has God tried to wake people up? Yes. We live in a world today. Does God try to wake people up even in the world we're in today? Yes. Right? And what happens to people? What do people say? Ah, I don't know if I really want that. You know, I can choose to do what I want to do. Realize something. The contradiction of doing what you want to do is, is, is direct with God. Because God says, look, this is what I tell you to do. And either you follow my commands or you do what you want to do. That's what Satan did, right? And the beast is led by Satan, right? Yes. So you've got this picture. You've got a choice. You either follow Satan or you follow God. It sounds so simple, right? But everything that's going on here, remember, you're going to have probably about four billion people that are dead. We've talked about this so far. Four billion dead people, right? The skies are going to be darkened. Some of the things that are taking place here, we see these things that are taking place on earth, and you've got this, and people will still want to follow the beast. They'll still want to follow, worship the image. Look, imagine this. You, you, you look at our, our, you know, just what we have in terms of science and all the things today. You, you think about this, and even, even what I had removed with the cancer, right? They, they cut it out, right? They cut it out. They took a piece of me right? I don't get that piece back. And I get a nice little stitch here, right? No, I don't dis uh, at this point. I don't, at this point, when I get to heaven, I'm not worried about this at all. Whatever, whatever, this, whatever this turns out to be when I get there, I'm not, I'm not worried at all, right? See? I mean, think about it. We go through life, and we, we live life, and we have a choice. We can either follow God, and we can follow what Jesus says, or we can go against God. And people want to say, well, you know what? I can't make up my mind. Well, guess what? They're going to have to make up their mind. You're not going to have a choice here. See, when the tribulation period happens and these things are taking place, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you follow Jesus or do you follow Satan? Because the beast is going to say, you know what? If you don't follow me, I'm going to kill you. You go, well, you know, it can't be that bad, right? Remember, we have these locusts. Remember the locusts we talked about that sting? And for five months, it aches and hurts, right? I mean, there's stuff that's going on here. You go, well, you know, how bad can it be? Just think about it right now. You think the times are bad sometimes here? Imagine some of the worst of the worst. At least you have people still on the face of this earth that care about other beings. Imagine if you take those people out and all you have is people caring about themselves, what that's going to look like. Now you get to verse 12. And verse 12 says, the requirement. See, we, we talked about those who don't believe and follow Satan. And these are the ones who are going to believe, okay? This requires the steadfast endurance of the saints, those who obey God's commandments and hold to their faith in Christ. So there's a definite distinction, right? We saw already those who, who take the mark of the beast. What's the mark of the believer? The mark of the believer is they're going to follow the commandments and they're going to hold to the faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that each believer is marked by God. So you've got this, this dichotomy here where you see both sides and you go, well, which one would I choose? Now, we look at this whole situation that's taking place here. We know what's going to happen at the end. We're going to get to chapter 22 and we're going to see what's going to happen, right? And the interesting thing in our world today is when you watch movies, you know, you, I was watching Armageddon the other day, right? And we, we need Bruce Willis. Now Bruce Willis is not really in good shape, right? But Bruce Willis is going to save us from that asteroid, right? And so as this is happening, it's all our technology and all our science and all our knowledge is the thing that's going to save us, right? When you watch that movie, that's what's going to save us. But realize something. Technology doesn't save us. It just took a chunk of me, right? It doesn't save us. See, when you look around, you realize something. That the things that we're looking at today that we have our hope in, they're short-termed. 
And what God is saying is this is the long term. Long term here is if you obey his commandments and you have faith in Christ, he's got you covered. But you've got to stand tall. You've got to stand strong. You can't just waver. You've got to stand with God and realize that even when things and times get tough, you've got to stand with him. Now you get to verse 13. Verse 13 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Okay, so now we've got this shift here. We've got this, and it says, write this. Blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this moment on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they can rest from their hard work because their deeds will follow. So what, what he's saying here is during the tribula tribulation period, those who die, okay, they're blessed. Why? Because they're following Jesus, okay? Which, when we've looked at what we've looked at so far up to this point, especially when we talked about the Antichrist and the false prophet and what we've seen with all that, they're going to force people to worship what they want to worship, right? What they want them to worship. They're going to want them to worship them. And think about this. I don't know about you, but I mean, I've been a sports fan at times in my life, right? And the teams that I worship, you know, worship, I support, right? Um, they let me down time after time, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Tony right now is going through that with every team he's following, poor guy. Okay? So whatever team he picks, they're, they're, they're going downhill, right? So, um, but what happens is when you look at this, we, we, we have this, we wear their colors, we wear all those things to support them, right? Amen. And it's funny because Rick just said to me, he goes, what happens, Rick? Only one team wins, right? Everybody else loses their last game, right? Everybody else loses their last game. Think about that for a second. The majority of Americans are following the loser, right? So the last game you watch, your team lost. But what we know about Jesus is the very last thing, he wins, right? See, realize something. When you look at this, he's got you in his hand. He's got you covered. He's got you marked. He marks you with the Holy Spirit. You're his, and he's got you so that, you know what, in the end, you win. And I think it's so powerful when you look at this. He says, blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this moment on, to be in Jesus Christ. See, do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're headed? Because even our families, right? Don't we want our families to know Christ? See, you know, my mom passed away over three years ago, and see my dad last night and talking for a while. Like, you know, time's short, right? Yes. Time is, I mean, it goes by so fast. I remember when I was 18, right? I, I remember 18. And my body still wants to think I'm 18, right? And the problem is my body's not 18, right? It was I remember years ago when my grandfather was still alive one time, we were out in the car, and, and I was, I guess, 12 or 13 years old, and we were coming back from having lunch. And I said to him, I said, I said, Pop, I said, you know, um, when did you get old looking? <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was stupid at this point, right? And he said to me, he goes, I'm not really old looking. I said, oh, yes, you are, okay? <laughs> and he goes, but I'm not really old looking. And I said, but Pop, you are old looking, okay? And I look back now, and he was like only like 65, okay? Yeah, I know. I'm five years away from old, you know? Um, and so I remember thinking that, but realize, isn't old relative? I mean, if you realize something, because Carl always tells me, wait until you get old, right? He always tells me, wait until you get old, you know? I remember when I was 50, he told me my eyesight was going to go bad, okay? My eyesight's still good, praise the Lord, right? But he said those things will start to happen. You realize something. You, it's all relative how we look at things. But with God, he's eternal, right? Eternal. That there's no beginning and no end. With God, it's going to go on forever. So when these things all take place, when judgment finally happens, when God sets up his kingdom and he rules and reigns and we're with him, guess what? That's with him forever. We don't have to worry about the frailty and the failures of our humanity. We're going to be with him. Now you get to verse 14. It says, and I looked, and a white cloud appeared, and him, and seated on the white cloud was the one like the Son of Man. Now, we know when we see like the Son of Man, it means who? Jesus. Usually Jesus, right? It refers to Jesus. And he had a golden crown on his head, which again um, marks that that's Christ because he has the gold crown, his kingship, his ruling. And it says, and he had a sharp sickle in his hand. Okay? You know what sickles are used for, right? 
cut down the harvest, right? Okay, now think about this. This is the picture you've got here. Here he comes on a white cloud, and he's got the sickle. Okay, so who's he coming for? See, right, judgments is going to happen, right? And who's in charge of judgment? Jesus is in charge of judgment, sorry. So verse 15, it says, Then another angel came out of the temple, shouting in a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and start to reap, because the time to reap has come, since the earth's harvest is ripe. Okay, so you get this picture here, right? Here comes this angel, and he's going to reap. He's going to reap those that are what? Those who are with him, right? Now, I'm going to pause here a second, and I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 13, okay? Because Jesus tells this parable, and I think it's interesting here that we at least look at this parable real fast. So Matthew 13, um, verses 24 through 30, okay? It says here, and let me make sure I go back to that one. Okay, it says, um, he presented them with another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a person who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed darnel among the wheat and went away. Now, darnel is a poisonous weed, okay? And if you eat it, it can make you drunk. Eat too much of it will kill you, okay? I know a lot of times it'll say tares in your Bible. It's not tares. It's actually, tares is a little bit gentler than what actually was. In Roman culture, if you planted darnel in someone else's field, you could be charged with a crime and arrested and prosecuted for it, okay? So you, you realize that Darnell is something different than just ta tares. So you, you get this picture here and it says, um, they, they sowed Darnell among the wheat and went away. When the plant sprouted and produced grain, then the Darnell also appeared. So the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then why is this Darnell there? And where did it come from? The landowner says, an enemy has done this. The slave replied, do you want me to go and gather it? And he said, no, since in gathering the darnel, you may uproot the wheat that is along with it. So let both grow together, together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first collect the darnel and tie it in bundles to be burned, but then gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, now we just saw what we're seeing in Revelation, right? He's coming out with the sickle, and he's coming to gather. So Jesus is talking about the same situation. So we're going to look here, and, and I'll read this again from verse 15. Then another angel came out of the temple, shouting a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud. Use your sickle to start to reap, because the time to reap has come since the earth harvest is ripe. See, the believers and the non-believers are what? They're together on earth, right? And so what's happening is the time's come for harvest, Right? And he's got to separate them, correct? So you get to verse 16. Verse 16 says, So the one seed on the cloud swung a sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay? So he's got his, right? You get to verse 17. Then another angel came out of the heaven, temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Verse 18. Another angel who was in charge of the fire. You hear that? Okay? We just talked about here, right? What happens to the ones that don't believe? They're burned up in the fire, right? That's what he did with the Darnell. He took it. Burned. So he goes, look, he says, he came from the altar and called in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle. Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grape off the vine of the earth because its grapes are now ripe. And it's interesting because this is a little bit of a different picture here. Um, the, word, the word for the, the last harvest was kind of a, a, a dried up type of um, harvest. But this one is, they're plump. They're ready to be harvested, okay? These are the people now, you've got this picture here, that have been living and going against God completely. And what happens is that ripe harvest is ready to happen. The time of God's judgment has come, okay? God's let his judgment, he's allowed his mercy and grace to go as far as it's going to go. And now it's time for judgment. You got that? See, as you look at this picture, like a, a, a grape that's ready to be harvested for, for wine, it's plump, it's juicy, right? And now he's going to come and get these grapes. And what happens is that's the time. God's given all the people on earth a chance. He's given people the chance to make their decision and follow him or go their own way. And it's hard. He, he's, he's exhausted his grace and mercy at this point. 
And then you get to verse 19. It says, so the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth and tossed them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now, when we just had Rick read from Isaiah 63, right? Who's the only one trampling in that wine press? Jesus, right? And think about this. This is the picture. These are the people who've rejected God, the people who want nothing to do with God. You've got this judgment that takes place now. You've got this wine press. And it's an interesting thing because a wine press, has anybody ever done a wine press? Oh, it's really cool. You take your feet, your shoes off, okay? You want to make sure your feet are clean. But you take your shoes off, you take your socks off, and you just start stomping on the grapes, okay? Huh? Oh, but it's so cool. It, it really is cool because having done this, I can tell you, it's really fun because you start doing it, you doing it, and you start to get tired after a while. But the grapes squish between your toes, and it's really a really cool feeling because every time you step on them, they just squish and ooze, okay? And it oozes, and more and more juice is pr produced. And you step more and squash more, and the juice oozes out and squashes all over the place. And it becomes, the, the fruit becomes less and less fruit, more and more juice. And as it squashes, it just, oh, it just, it, and you can feel it in your toes. And it's like, you know, and you wiggle your toes a little bit to get a little bit out of it. And it's just really, really fun. But the juice then runs out the bottom of the barrel, okay? And that's how they collect it. This is how God is displaying his anger, right, towards those who haven't accepted him, okay? To those who decide to go against him. For those who decide to follow the Antichrist and the beast, all those people who rejected God over all the centuries, this is how God has chosen to represent this. A wine press, okay? And I, I thought about this because even when I was doing this, okay, you know how long it takes to get a little bit out? You know how many grapes they put in to get out a bottle of wine? Isn't it great? As you're drinking your wine, and I just remember, somebody was stomping on that baby, okay? <laughs> Did they wash their feet, right? Did the person that you got your wine from wash your, their feet, right? So you've got that picture. You've got that picture here. Now look at verse 20. We're going to close with this this morning. It says, And the wine press was stomped outside the city, and blood poured out of the wine press up to the height of horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now, it's funny because if you read commentaries and everything else, people want to say, well, it can't be that high. And actually, the length of Israel is about 160 miles, so people even argue whether it's 200 miles, maybe it's just 160, because this whole battle, this whole thing's taking place around Israel. So you've got this stopping of, of humanity, Right? And the blood goes out for over 200 miles and the height of a bridle and a horse. Doesn't that make you feel uncomfortable? Because we always want to talk about God. We always say, God's a God of love, right? But God is a God of judgment too. See, you either accept what Christ has done or you face judgment. You can't just say, well, God loves me. He's going to forgive everything because, you know what, I'm a good person. God would like me because if he hung out with me for a day, we'd be buds, right? That's right? not how it works, does it? See, and the picture you get here should be so sobering because when you look at this and you think about the blood, I mean, I, I, you know, when you think about the grapes, but now this is humanity. This is the judgment falling on humanity. It's a sad and really one, it's heartbreaking because people won't turn from this, right? And so you've got this picture of the height of horses' bridles, right? And 200 miles. Look at this and go, man, how can people not turn to Jesus, right? When you walk out of here, the one thing you should realize some, more than anything else is whose hand are you in? Jesus. You're in Jesus's, right? And realize he's not crushing you, is he? Okay? But see, people want to say to you, well, you know what? I'm not worried about judgment. I'm not worried about what's going to happen. Realize something. They better, yeah. right? They better worry because you know what? The time goes by fast. Yeah. And people say, well, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. And realize waiting isn't going to help you. We see in the tribulation period, it's either Jesus or Satan, right? You know, it's not all these other religions. It's either Jesus or Satan. And see, when I look around and I think about today and think about the world today, our world is losing hope, right? Yes. I mean, everything about our world is falling apart. I mean, if you listen to science right now, our world is falling apart, right? 
everything about our world. I mean, think about it. Imagine you were a teenager today, right? I mean, everything's a mess. And you can blame us all you want, you know, the older people. But realize something. If it's a mess, God created the planet so that it could sustain life, okay? And he says, be fruitful and multiply. So either one is right and one is wrong, right? I mean, you have to realize something. If God says these things, then he's saying, you know what? I've created this place to endure and sustain you, okay? But science is telling us, nope. We need to get rid of people, right? Get rid of people. Like, oh, I got to look at you and say, you're wrong. You, you shouldn't be here. You're a mistake. Isn't that a shame? That God loves every single one of us, and he sent his son to die on the cross so that we could have that relationship. And the best part of that is that he did it because he loved you. And all you've got to do now is receive it. And if you receive it, he's got you covered. But if not, there's judgment, right? And a wine press is not a p pretty picture, is it? And think about it, we're not even done yet. We move into chapter 15 next week, and there's all kinds of more good stuff to go on here, right? Right? Go out of here today, and remember, the last thing that we did when we did the call to worship was what? Smile, Smile right? Because he's your savior, right? He died on the cross for you. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a great and awesome God you are. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we pray that, Lord, we would, we would trust in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. He delivered us from his sins, Lord, from our sins because of the fact that we needed that, Lord, that we, we've trespassed against God and that, Lord, we need to have that relationship with you. So, Lord, I pray for every person here that they would know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for our family, our friends, even our, our enemies, Lord, they come to know you. And Lord, we thank you for today because this is the day that you've made and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. So we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, that's it. You okay? So do you want to get Dave, Kristen? We're going to close with our final psalm this morning. So as we, um, we're going to sing Because He Lives. If anybody has need for um, prayer, you're more than welcome to come forward and I'll anoint you with oil and we'll pray. Um, the other thing is this, is uh, when we do... Um, sunrise service at 640 on um, Easter. Just remember, we up the top of the street, okay, and um, try to get here so that you can watch the sun rise. At, so it rises at 641, so I say 640 so that you can have that. So um, now, <laughs> yeah, she just snuck out here. So we are having a birthday cake for Krista this morning, so, um, so please feel free to join us and have some cake. So, okay. Anybody any questions? Anything you want to ask? Okay. Okay. Huh? Really? <laughs> it's it's smack you upside the head, cage. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe it's not cake, cake. Okay, there we go. So. Well, we had a, a, a funny question, so we oh. went with that one, Dave. Oh, sorry, well, sorry, I missed it. Everybody <laughs> stare at Dave while he's getting ready, no, please. <laughs> Let's all stand together <laughs> and sing praises to God. We'll sing Because He Lives. I believe in the sun. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. Amen, amen. Let my song join the one that never ends because he lives. 
I was dead in the grave. I was dead in the grave. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone away. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my soul join the one that never ends. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. I know he holds my life, my future in his hands. Amen. Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my soul join the one that never ends because he lives. Because he lives. Good morning, prayer. Your Heavenly Father, we can come to you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, I just pray that we would rejoice in the fact that you've given us this day as a blessing. And that, Lord, we would just be so happy because we know that our Savior, not only, not only does he live, but he lives in us. And that, Lord, he gives us that joy, that joy that can um, just exceed any boundary, Lord. And we thank you for that. We go out of this place with joy in our hearts, Lord. I thank you for each heart was here. I pray that you will bless them, watch over them, keep them. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before you walk out of here this morning, just give someone uh, just an arm around the shoulder and say, I was glad that you're here this morning. So. Amen.